Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at the use of spectroscopy to enable us to find the structure of different compounds. There are lots of different types of spectroscopy that are used in chemistry and we're going to focus on four of them. If you've not already watched my other videos on spectroscopy, I'll have them linked down below as you will find them very helpful for this video. We're going to focus on organic spectroscopy today, so looking at compounds which contain carbon. The four types of spectroscopy that we're looking at are elemental analysis, which allow you to find the empirical formula of a compound, mass spectrometry, which allows you to find fragments of the molecule, and also the gram formula mass in conjunction with elemental analysis, infrared spectroscopy, which allows you to find functional groups, and then finally nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which allows you to find hydro hydrogen environments, numbers of hydrogens in those environments and their connectivity. So let's have a look at an example of trying to find the structure of a compound using spectroscopy. So here we have some information about a compound X. It contains 69.77% carbon, 11.63% hydrogen and 18.6% oxygen and has a relative molecular mass of 86. So the first bits of information there are coming from the elemental analysis. The relative molecular mass of 86 would have came from mass spectrometry. It says here it reacts slowly with sodium to produce hydrogen, but it does not react with bromine water and it does react with acidified potassium permanganate solution to produce Y. So acidified potassium permanganate solution is an oxidizing agent, so we'll just put that in brackets here just now. And you have the infrared spectrum of X and Y here at the side. You're to try and identify compounds X and Y. To start, we'll have a look at compound X and calculate its empirical formulae. So we have carbon, and if we just assume that the percentages are the masses present. We then divide these by the relative atomic masses of the elements. And then divide by the smallest one to get the ratio. So the ratio of the elements in compound X is C5H10O1. So that is our empirical formulae for X. If we now use the molecular mass of 86 to work out what the actual formulae is, if you're to work out the gram formula mass of this empirical formulae, you'll find that that is also 86. So C5H10O is the final formula for X. If we have a look at the infrared spectra on page 14 of the data book, we can identify a couple of different peaks which are useful to look at. So within X, we have this peak here at around 3200, and that is usually indicative of a hydroxyl group in an alcohol. That is still present in Y. So that's an OH group. However, in Y, we also have this peak here, which is characteristic of a carbonyl group, so C double bond O. That would indicate that compound X is an alcohol and compound Y is a carboxylic acid. If we look at the details that we have about compound X and its reactivity, it says that it reacts with sodium slowly to produce hydrogen gas. Alcohols react with uh, reactive metals to produce alkoxides and hydrogen gas so that would reinforce our knowledge that this is indeed an alcohol. It then reacts with potassium permanganate solution which is an oxidizing agent which would then allow you to produce a carboxylic acid. The final bit of information we have is that it doesn't react with bromine water. Now this is essential for us to know because this cannot be pentanol. We don't have enough hydrogens for this to be a straight chain alcohol. So in fact, it would have to either have a double bond or have a cycloalkane aspect to it. With it not reacting with bromine water, this must be a cycloalkane based alcohol. 
as it can be oxidised to a carboxylic acid, the hydroxyl group must be on the end of a chain. That means the hydroxyl group cannot be in the middle of the ring, um, so it can't be cyclopentanol because that wouldn't be able to be oxidised. So in fact, the structure for X must look something more like this, where we have a methyl group coming off of a ring of four, and on that methyl group is your alcohol group. The structure for Y would then be the oxidised version of this to a carboxylic acid. For this example, the empirical formula has already been calculated as C2H6S. You've been given the mass spectrum and the NMR of this compound and asked to find what the, form, the structure of the compound would be. So if we have a look at the empirical formulae first, and if we calculate the GFM of the empirical formulae, then you'll find that that is 62. If we look at the molecular ion of our mass spec, that we've got shown here, it's the same as the gram formula mass. That means that our formulae for this compound must be C2H6. We can then have a look at some of the other peaks and this can help us identify what sort of structure we must have. So we have a peak here at 47 and there are two options for what the peak at 47 could be. So your peak at 47 could be a fragment which contains CH3 to an S, making this some sort of symmetrical molecule, or it could be CH2 attached to SH, making this more like a sulfur equivalent of an alcohol. Another very strong peak we have here is at 29, and if we have a look at 29, the only option that we can have for 29 is that we have CH3 and CH2 joined together. So that's just adding up the masses of the elements that are there and then just checking them off against the value on the mass charge ratio. If 29 is to be CH3 attached to CH2, then this would rule out the possibility of having this um, more symmetrical molecule. If we then have a look at the chemical shifts that we have. So at 1.2, that is usually a CH3 group. 1.5, we don't have anything definitive that would uh, fit for our compound, but then at 2.4, we have CH2, uh, usually attached to something slightly more reactive. If we have a look at the area under the peak, this is in roughly a 3 to 1 to 2 ratio, which matches up with the mass spec data that we have, where we have a CH3, a CH2, and then SH being the 1. So that would imply that our 1.5 on the NMR is going to be an SH peak. Putting all of that together and joining it so that all of the elements have the correct valency, you have an SH on the end of the chain there, CH2 and then CH3. I've got two examples for you to try, so I'll bring up the first one, pause the video now and try this example. So let's go through each part of this question together. The first part is asking you to calculate the empirical formulae for the compound. You're given the mass of the overall compound and then you're given the mass of carbon dioxide and water which is produced when you burn the compound. This will allow you to calculate the mass of carbon and hydrogen within the compound and also the mass of oxygen. Let's go through the steps required to do that. So starting with the carbon dioxide, the first thing that we're going to calculate is the number of moles of carbon dioxide produced. So we're going to do mass divided by gram formula mass. That gives us around 0 0.27 moles of carbon dioxide and that will be the same as 0 0.27 moles of carbon in the original compound. That will allow us to calculate the mass of carbon by doing moles times gram formula mass of carbon, which will give us 3.24 grams of carbon. 
We can then do the same with water. So first of all, we will calculate the moles of water. So if we take the 6.08 grams of, of water that's produced and divide it by the gram formula mass, to get 0 0.33 moles of water. Now water has two hydrogens in it, which means that we will have twice as many moles of hydrogen. We can then calculate the mass of hydrogen that was in the compound. And we're just multiplying by one here because we're just dealing with individual hydrogen atoms. To get the mass of oxygen that's present, as that will not produce a product when you burn it, we're going to take the five grams of the total mass and take away the mass of carbon plus the mass of hydrogen. This gives us a mass of oxygen of 1.084 grams. We can now use these values that we've just calculated to calculate the empirical formula. So we had 3.24 grams of carbon 0 0.676 grams of hydrogen and 1.084 grams of oxygen. We divide each of them by their relative atomic masses to get number of moles. And then divide by the smallest number for each to get the ratio. So the smallest number is going to be the oxygen one, which will lead us to a ratio of 4, 10 and 1. So the empirical formula for this compound will be C4H10O. Looking now at part 2 of this question. What functional group is responsible for the peak at 1140 per centimetre in the IR spectra to the right? So if you look in the data book, you'll be able to find the different um, peaks that you will have for infrared. And if you have a look in the section which has the 1140 part, you'll find that this is an alkyl ether. It's the only one which fits for this particular band. Okay, looking at part three. We are given the molecular ion from the mass spectrum is 74. What is the molecular formula? So to be able to work out the molecular formula, we use the empirical formula. And whatever your molecular formula will be a multiple of the empirical formula. So if we work out the gram formula mass of our empirical formula, So if we add all these values together, then we find that our gram formula mass of the empirical formula is the same as the molecular ion. That means that the multiple of the empirical formula is 1, so your molecular ion must also have a formula of C4H10O. <coughs> Finally, we're given the NMR spectrum of the compound. And it only shows two peaks in the spectrum, one slightly taller than the other. We know in total that there are 10 hydrogen ions and that these are now being split unevenly between the two. As an initial guess, I would say that they're in a ratio of 6 to 4. But we can confirm that later on. We then need to have a look at roughly where these peaks are. So we've got one here that's around about 1.3. And then another one that's around about 3.6. If you look in the data book, you'll be able to find some values for these. So 1.3 is quite firmly in the CH3 region. And if we think that this has a ratio of 6 to 4, then that would be two CH3 groups. And then around about 3.6, we'll find um, CH2 groups, specifically those of an ether. So if we have a look at all the information we have, we have our formula that we're using for this molecule. We know that it has an ether group, which is linking up with the 
NMR. Uh, we know what the full molecular formula is and we have guessed that we have a 6 to 4 ratio. A 6 to 4 ratio would fit here if we have two CH3 groups and two CH2 groups. As there's only these two peaks, this has to be symmetrical if we've got two of each of these groups. So the actual structure for the formula must be CH3, CH2, then to the ether functional group, and then CH2, CH3. So this would be diethyl ether or ethoxyethane. Here's a second example for you to try. Pause the video now. Okay, like before, we will go through each of the steps individually. So in this example, we've been given percentages of different elements to calculate the empirical formula from. So if you just assume that those percentages are masses and that it's adding up to 100, so we have 50 grams of carbon, 5.6 of hydrogen and 44.4 of oxygen. You divide by the relative atomic masses of each to give you 4.17, 5.6 and 2.775. We then divide by the smallest, which is the oxygen again, and that gives you a ratio of 1.5, 2 and 1. We can't have 1.5 of a carbon, so we're going to multiply up, so we get 3, 4 and 2, which gives us an empirical formula of C3H4O2. Looking at part 2, what functional group is responsible for the peak at 1710? So again, looking in the data book, and we're looking for this peak here. This is a very characteristic peak and is almost always a carbonyl at C double bond O. It would be worth noting that we also have a very broad peak here at around about 3000, which would be an OH group. So that may come in handy later. We're using the mass spectrum to identify the formula for compound A. So this time we need to look for the molecular ion. It's always the highest peak, so it's 72 here. So this is our molecular ion. The one with 100% abundance is your base peak. So like we did before, we're going to work out the gram formula mass of our empirical formulae and then use that to get a multiple if required. So the gram formula mass of the empirical formula is 72, that is the same as the molecular ion. So the formula for the compound must be the same, so we have C3H4O2. This one is asking you to investigate the mass spectrum in a little bit more detail. So we have um, some different peaks, this one is the full molecule. We know that the molecule has a C double bond O. We also suspect that it has an OH group from this part here. And then otherwise we must just have some carbon and hydrogen bonds. And we are looking for a fragment which will add up to 27. Anything involving our oxygen here is going to be higher immediately. So we're going to ignore that and look at adding together some carbons and hydrogens. So if we imagine that this had some sort of CH3, That is always 15. Um, a CH2 is always 14. So we mustn't have those two beside each other because that will also be too, too high. We don't really have enough hydrogens for this to have full single bonds. So if we envisage that this maybe has a double bond within it, perhaps some structure like this then we could try and add some of the fragments up here. This fragment is going to be too high and anything within here won't add up properly either. So if we have a look at what this fragment here would be, 
we'd have 12 plus 2 is 14 plus another 12 to be 26 plus another 1 to be 27 and it's an extremely stable fragment so it's likely that this would be together. So the fragment itself will have these atoms and you have to show the charge. The charge is where this is going to break so it'll have a positive charge here. So this would be a potential ion fragment for 27. If we put together all of the things that we have, so we're thinking that this is our ion fragment, we have a C double bond O, we have an OH, that would imply that this could potentially be a carboxylic acid. That would lead us to the structure that I just drew out previously. And this fits all of the information that we have here in the question. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Kim for regular updates on new videos. Bye for now.